today, and it requires a little explanation. Now, I planned this to be a day when I didn't go through a chapter in the textbook, but I'd show you some extra things outside the textbook. I have a few of those days in the schedule to handle things that might come up. And what I was going to show you today is Velociraptor, but something more important has come up, which I'm sure you all know, which is machine learning. In the last two or three months, artificial intelligence has become so important that it's going to change the whole world. And the venture capitalists I listen to uh, on have said that this is the big one. They say, we watched, we invested billions of dollars in Web3, in 3D printing, in wearables, in headsets to give you augmented reality, and all that was garbage. None of that went anywhere. It didn't really turn into a real product that people could use. It didn't really make any money. But they say, artificial intelligence is really going to be big. It's going to be as big as the iPhone. It's going to explode. It's going to make tons of money. Everyone's going to be hiring like crazy for people who can do it. And so I said, I really need to add it to my classes. Now, a student brought it up last week. So I got a textbook. I found out it's pretty easy. So I wrote some projects. So I'm going to show you some machine learning projects today. And it's worth extra credit in any of my classes. And I highly encourage you to do it because now it is very easy to do. And understanding how it works is going to be essential for any tech career. It is coming on like a freight train. Everything we use is going to have artificial intelligence in it from now on. And if you understand that, you will be much better off than if you don't understand that. So that's what I want to show you is some machine learning projects. I'm going to, it's going to count in any of my classes, but I did put it on this 121 page and also on my home page. I got three projects so far and I'll probably make a lot more. And one thing that is great about this is you don't need to install anything or set up anything. This is, uh, I was real happy when this happened to Web3, which I had old classes about. They've made online tools to learn it that are very good. So the main one is this first one where you do some simple machine learning and you learn how to do it. And we're going to use this thing called Google Collab. Google Collab is a Google service that runs Python in an online sandbox. And not only does it run Python, but you have a powerful machine that even has GPUs that you're using. So using it there is probably more powerful than it would be if you installed it locally. And it's free, which is bloody awesome. You can't beat that. So I've launched it in another browser. This is what Google Collab looks like. You have to log into a Gmail account. Any Gmail account will do. As far as I know, I haven't tested a City College student account, but I assume it would work. And then you see this page offering you um, nothing if you haven't opened one. There's something here to make a new notebook. Now, these things are called Jupyter Notebook. They spell Jupyter funny with a Y, and I don't really understand what they are, but there's some way to make some kind of online assembly of codes and documents that you can work in. But for, for what we're going to do today, it's just an online place you can run Python. That's all we need. So you make a new notebook, and... Now you have a notebook. And so you can do things like print hello. And then you can run it with this run button. And it's uh, still running, showing these dots going around, which is kind of silly. But hopefully it will eventually print something down here. Um, initializing. I wonder if I've got, OK, there it comes, finally giving me hello. So it's ready. I can execute Python code. and. It's not obvious, but I'm in fact running it in a very powerful environment, so we can do complicated things. So let's do some AI. The first one, we're going to use TensorFlow. TensorFlow is the library that does machine learning. By the way, um, what we're doing is technically called machine learning, which I believe is a subset of the larger category called artificial intelligence. But this is the stuff that really matters. This is what GPT-4 does. And we'll see what it does. Machine learning does what scientists do. That's why I was amazed when I first learned about it. It's exactly what I used to do as an experimental physicist, where you measure something, and then you just try to find some equation that will predict the measurements. That's how science starts. Then you invent something called the law of gravity or something. But first, you just measure something and put a line through it. That's uh, what science does. So we're going to import TensorFlow and just print the TensorFlow version. And the only point of this is to show that it's working. So uh, this, the TensorFlow is the main library we need. And this online Python Sandbox is, in fact, very nice, and everything you need will come right in. So it is running. There it goes, printing out the version, 2.12.0. So it runs, and I don't really care what version it is. We're not going to do anything fancy. Any version will do, as far as I can tell. So now what we're going to do is we're going to fit some things. So, uh-oh, um, my, all right. Something's weird has happened. But anyway, the point is, if you have these numbers, suppose you ignore these funny characters at the start. There's some kind of non-printable characters. So you have 1, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then you have 3, 
1, 1, 3, 5, and 7. And uh, it'll be easier when I figure out how to get rid of these stupid non-printable characters. But the point is, if you look at this, if you try to figure out what's going on here, you say, well, as the x goes up, the y goes up. But, oh, this is minus 1 and minus 3. That's what those crazy characters are. Um, so but now you see, if the x goes up by 1, the y goes up by 2. And it doesn't have 0 isn't 0. 0 is minus 1. So the equation that describes this is y is 2x minus 1. Now, this is why I said this is what science is. In science, you measure something, like the electric field on something, and you, you, have, you vary something, like the electric field, and then you measure something like the current through something, and you just get these numbers, and then you just try to figure out what curve will go through those numbers. That's how it starts. Then you um, try to, that's how, and that's what this does. So the question is, this process, where you go from just a list of numbers to an equation, that is what we're going to do. That's machine learning. Now, humans can do this somewhat automatically. I look at something, I can estimate what's going on, like I can drive a car. I can look ahead and see there's a curve and there's something in my way, so I can figure out how to steer to go around it. And that's what we need for machine learning. You have some kind of inputs, and you have to figure out a model of what's going on in order to figure out what to do with it. So we're going to do that puzzle right there with machine learning, and the great thing is it's only about 10 lines of code. So here's the code that learns how to solve that situation. I'll just delete the old code, put in the new code. All right, and now I'll talk about it. So I import some libraries, and then we have to find a thing called a model. This is a, a sequential is the only kind of model we're ever going to use. I'll have a diagram out later. This, and this is going to have one neuron, and it's going to take one input. And the neurons are the part that do processing, just like this is all modeled after the human brain. In the human brain, you have these cells called neurons, and they get signals from things like the photoreceptors in your eye, and each one of them will get input from several photoreceptors, and each one will then pass to another layer of neurons. Several of these neurons will go to those neurons, and these layers learn how to do things, even though they don't start with any programming in them. So you define the model, and then you train it. So we have one neuron here, and it's going to compile it, and then here's the data. Minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and minus 3, minus 1, 1, 3, 5, 7. So it's that thing where y is 2x minus 7 and I have about six or seven points of it, that's the data. So now I do the model fit, which will, this is going to learn how to simulate that data. And the way it works is it just chooses some random guess to start from, and then it tries to improve the guess. And what it's going to do is use this um, SGD, which is gradient descent. It's going to try and figure out, it's going to have a measure of success, which is mean squared error, which is commonly what you do. It takes all the numbers from my current model and how much they're wrong by, squares them and adds them up, and then it tries to see which direction would make the error smaller. Go that way. Just like slide a ball sliding down a hill. If it moves in the direction that's of, of uh, gradient descent, and it's going to do that 500 times. It's going to start randomly and go through 500 steps of trying to move in the way that will make it better, and then when it's done, it's going to try and predict what the answer is for 10. And if it gets it right, we know the answer should be 19. 2 times 10 plus minus 1 is 19. So that's all this is going to do, and I just point out how extremely easy it is, how very little information you had to put in to do that. So you can run this thing, and now here it goes. These are the 500 learning epochs. It is 500 times trying to improve it. It's up to like 300 already. I say we're running on some fast computer that can do all this without making us wait a long time or pay any money. So when it gets down to 500, now it has measured the loss. Now the loss here is the error. So notice at the start, when it first guessed, if I get back to someplace early, right, when it first started, the loss was 3. Then it moved down to 2.9, down to 2.6, 2.0, so it's finding the right direction to move, to make the loss smaller, and it's going to eventually get that loss down to almost 0, uh, which is down here around by 500, it's down to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5. So it's practically 0. And so now, when I predict the... Uh, value for 10, I get 18.98. And the right answer is 19. So it got very close. And by the way, it's random. There's noise in it. So this time it got 18.98. And the loss got down to 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5. But if I run it again, yeah, I'll get different numbers. Different every time you run it. Uh, not by a whole lot. If you've got a model that is converging to a good answer, Sometimes it varies around. It's 18.98 again, and 4 times 10 to the minus 5. So anyway, that's, that's machine learning. It has learned to predict a straight line. 
in this very simple situation, which is, of course, a very simple issue. But that's how we start. Okay. So this, this, what we've got here is a neural network with one layer. X comes in, it has one neuron that can just do some kind of mathematics on it with a couple parameters. It can make a straight line. It can try to find these numbers, M and C. Multiply X by something and add a constant, and then out comes Y. That's our current neural net, just one neuron. And this is what you might see in like, you know, microscopic bacteria or something, this kind of thinking. And so, but it was a perfect situation, it would figure out that M is two and C is minus one. And in our case, it got pretty close. You can see it got pretty close to the answer. And uh, we can see what it learned. If we do this, if we print this line, now I could do the whole thing over, but uh, I learned later, it's remembering everything you do. So you only have to do the new code. So I'm just gonna do this one line of new code, that should work. If not, we'll do the whole thing over. But I don't think I need to, I go to the top, I delete the old stuff. Now I just wanna see the model. And uh, okay, that's right, I had to, do, okay, I do have to put it all in because I had to change more than just that one line. So I'll get this whole thing. I had to define this thing called L0 as the model. That object is gonna be the, um, the neural layer that does the calculation, which is called dense. A dense neural layer is one that has every possible connection to the layer above and below it. So uh, this one, let me run this one. I'll delete the old stuff and put in the new code. Okay, and run it. There we go. Now I should be getting those 500 epochs again, which are, you know, calculations of it followed by improvement. And there it's done. And here's what I learned. So here's the values. The first number that should be 2 is 1.996. And the next number that should be minus 1 is minus 0 0.989. So as you see, it's pretty close. Not perfect, but quite close to the correct answers. All right, so that's what it figured out. All right. Now, I want to give you a flag. So I just took those values and added some errors to them. So I just moved them up and down by a little bit. So if you have errors, then it will never be able to perfectly fit a straight line anymore. So let's um, change the Y line to this. That's why this stuff is so great. It's not even compiled, you know, it's Python. You can just change it and run it again. It is great. So I'm gonna change the Y values from that. In fact, I'll save them here by just commenting out this line with a pound sign. It's what you often do in Python so you don't lose the old data. And here's the new data. And so you can see, I just moved this by 0.1 and this by 0.05 and this by 0.07. I just added a little bit of random noise to it to make it a little more realistic. So if we run that one, same thing, 500 epochs of learning. Okay. And again, it, now it gets 18.9 when the right answer is 19 and this is 1.99, and this is minus 0.99. So again, it does pretty well. Even that noise didn't stop it. The one thing, though, was the loss got much bigger. Remember, the loss got down to 10 to the minus 5 before, but the loss can't get below a certain value because the noise means you're never going to fit those, you're never going to go through those things perfectly. And that'll be more clear in a later one where we draw some graphs to see this. So I tried to fit a parabola. I wondered how well I could do this. Here's a parabola x squared minus 4x plus 5. So this is going to be a curve like a bowl. And here's the values. Um, and 10 should be up at 55 if it can actually make a parabola fitting through this. So I change ys to this and see if it can fit that curve. And what I found was it's really, really bad at doing this. I delete the old stuff. I put in the new code. Whoops, I want to just, whoops, I wonder if I can undo. I can undo, that's cool. So I just want to change the y's again. And Control Z worked to undo it. That's nice. All right, so now I've got values here which are not a straight line. It's not just going up by two every time. It's going down by three, down by three, down by one, up by one, up by more. That's a curve. So if I run this, notice the loss is really big. This loss got down to 10 to the minus 5, and with some noise, it was getting down to 0, 0.00 something. Now the loss is staying way up at 4, and the answer is minus 12. Now the right answer is like 55, so it's way off. So all it's doing is putting a straight line through the curve, totally missing everything, because it's not smart enough to pass this kind of curve. So that's uh, not too surprising with this one-layer model, and I wondered how to do better, and I went online, and I found one that will do it. 
So this one takes a few steps, but this one is fitting a complex curve and graphing it out so we can see it. I got this from a blog. So this is going to create the data. What this is going to do is take the curve x times cosine of x. Now, if you know a little bit of math, the cosine goes up and down, and x times cosine of x will amplify the wings. So it'll be big and then small and then big again. So it's a nice complex curve that goes up and down a few times. And then it adds some random noise, 0 0.1. So the dry data goes up to 1 at minus 10 and 1 again at plus 10. So the data is bounded. Um, and the noise is 0.1 times random. So uh, then we're going to make the model. This model is much more complicated. It's going to have one unit to take data, then it's going to have a layer with 64 neurons and another layer with 64 neurons, and those are called hidden layers. And then um, one here with just one neuron at the end to be the output. So it's, this is very much like how your brain works. You have your vision receptors picking up light, and then you pass it through a layer of neurons and another layer of neurons, which are just random cells grown. Uh-oh, wait a minute now, I think I've lost uh, my twitch. Uh-oh, let me see, my twitch is suddenly showing uh, an error. Ah, it turned red on me again, ah. I wonder if the city college has hosed me again. Let me turn off the Wi-Fi and turn it on again. And connect again. What happens is the city college decides sometime that I need to sign in again or something. Um, I'm going to stop the streaming. Start the streaming. Ah, now it's turned green again. Okay, I I'm afraid my stream cut out. So if any of the people on Twitch can tell me. Uh, okay, whoa. All the Twitch people are gone? I'm not sure this network is working right. Let me check my VPN status. I'm not using VPN. Well, just a moment. I, I think I've lost my remote viewers. Let's see if I have any bandwidth. Um, it's fast.com. Well, okay, I've got some bandwidth. Ah, now it seems to be working again. Okay, good. But all my people are gone. So, uh, I don't know. This is disturbing. Let me try refreshing Twitch. Oh, good. Oh, people are here. Good. Just not showing your numbers anymore. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, let me go back to talking about this. All right. So, what happens here? Because um, you cut off. I had to start up, up again. Something about City College Network kicked me off. That's the kind of thing that happens a lot around here. All right. So, this is the curve that is just something that will go up and down a few times. And here's the random noise added to it. Then we're going to create the model. Now, I had a diagram of a multi-layer model in one of the instructions. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, this one is a simple one like that. I think if I go to the second project, I'll have a picture that's going to be better for this. Yeah, this is what you have. So in a more realistic model, closer to your brain, you have something like this. You have some receptors picking up stuff like the... Um, like the, neuro, the, the cells in your eye that pick up light, then they connect to a bunch of neurons, and then they connect to another bunch of neurons. And these might be outputs. So these ones in the middle that are not connected to the input or the output are called hidden layers. And this is how your brain really works. And they start out with no programming at all. They just learn from experience. And that's what we're going to do. So anyway, um, all right. So that's what this model does. If I go to my 100, which is here. Okay and uh, get down to the complex curve one. All right, so here we create the data, which is a noisy complex curve. Now here's the model. You define a sequential model, which means you're just gonna have a series of neurons. The first one is a single neuron that picks in the X data. The next one is 64 neurons, and next one is 64 neurons. You have a, a group of 64, and they're connected Every one of them together. So all possible 64 connections from this one to that one are there. And all possible 64 squared connections are from this one to that one. So every neuron connects to all the others. And then you have one output. So you have one input and one output. And inside there's two layers of 100, containing 128 neurons that are doing calculations. And you can display the model and then train it with 100 epochs. And then compute the output and then plot the results so we can see a nice graph. That's why this one's easier to understand than the last one where you just have to read those numbers. Here we're going to see a nice graph. And it's a little bit more steps, but it's still actually not a very complicated program. So let's go to the start up here, go to the top. Whoops, I went somewhere wrong. Okay, there we are. All right, put in this stuff and run it. 
There's the model, one neuron on the start, then 64, then 64, then one again. And notice there's 4,000 something parameters, 4,000 numbers to adjust, and here it is trying those 4,000 numbers, and the loss, which is the measure of error, started at some really big number, 0 0.1, and it's going down to 0 0.01, and there it is done, 0 0.01, so it got better. All right, and there's the answer. And as you can see, it did pretty well. The blue is the dots with noise, and the red is the fit, and it's not perfect, like, you know, this is a little bit below, but it's really quite good. That fitted curve seems to be pretty much matching the data. So that's with a thousand dots of data and with two layers of 64 neurons doing the learning. So that's a, that's a fairly realistic learning. We can fit a complex curve. And now if you get some flags, you just play with it. Like if we, let's try it with only one layer instead of two. This is why it is so nice to use this powerful setup. So all we have to do is go to the top Remember, here's a layer and here's another layer. I'm not going to make that bigger. All right, so all I got to do is remove one layer. I could delete it, but I'll just comment it out. There. Now it's only going to have one layer in the middle. Now I run that. And again, it's not going to take very long because I'm using Google's powerful hardware here. All right. And now, as you can see, it's a less perfect fit. Like this part is pretty wrong. It's not terrible though. And the loss is now 0 0.04 instead of 0 0.01. So, by the way, you can wonder if you didn't have to train it 100 times. If I trained it only 50 times, then it would be here at 0 0.12. So apparently it's good to train it 100 times. Training only 50 would really not be enough because this is going to go down to 0 0.04 if I keep going. All right, and there were a few other thing, games to play here with it. Um, down here I said you can vary the units and layers. So here you have to run it um, with 32 units per layer and one hidden layer or 16 units. Because remember the number of units is available. Let me just do the first one here so you can see it. 32 units and one hidden layer. Let's go up here and do that. Uh, I got to go here. Okay. Uh, that's this line here. One hidden layer is what we have. And here's the number of units, 64. So what if I had 32 instead? That would be a simpler model. And of course, you always try to use it with the minimum resources. If you go ahead, for, for many things, you'll just do whatever you have. But if you want to manufacture a product that you're going to sell people, like a cell phone or something, you would want to figure out how to do it with the minimum number of processing re uh, units required. So if I had 32 neurons in one layer, let's see how bad it is. You'd expect it to be worse. And there's the error is 0.1, the loss is 0.1, and still 0.1, and it stayed at 0.1, so that's pretty bad. You can see it's not really following the curve at all anymore. Uh, that's not accurate enough. Anyway, um, so there's a few things to do here and a few flags to find by trying these different ones. And uh, so this one here is various variations, and you have to find the one that's best. And here's one where you can vary the number of input data and noise. This is something that surprised me, by the way. This thing has a thousand points. And I said, I don't think you really need a thousand points to trace out that curve. So let's go back to the original one that worked. Let's start this. It's a good thing to demonstrate. Okay, let's get back to where we were, which was 64 units and two layers. Okay. So this one should do a really good job of following the curve. Let's just run that, make sure it's working. Whenever I'm doing programming, I always do this. Make one small change and test it. Make one more small change and test it because it's very easy to make a mistake. And if you go changing like five or ten lines of code before you test it, it's hard to find your error. So this one's, again, fitting pretty well. Not perfect, but pretty well. The loss is 0 0.01. All right, now, if I was to have less data points, like 100 instead of 1,000, I expected this to be just fine. And when I tried it before, it was not just fine. Wait, so, oh, that's right. If you change this to 100, you have to change this to 100 also. It, by the way, it's nice that it underlines the line that has an error for you to help you out. So now I've told I'm going to give you 100 data points, and now it's running without complaining. So here it is learning, and uh, it's done. And look at that. It's god awful. That confuses me. It feels, seems to me like I can still see the curve there. It's got just as many neurons and just as many training cycles, but it totally fails to get the answer now. So that's complicated, and I don't entirely understand why. But uh, that's why, you know, we all got to start learning this stuff and getting some experience with it so we can begin to understand this. So I have uh, 
flag where you try varying the number of points and the amount of noise to see what combination works best. Anyway, so that's the first one. And I'm going to stop this recording and make a separate recording for the next two projects, which are much shorter right now.